Fuck it. Uh, yeah. Good start. So, here I am, relaxing in my living room, proving to the world that you can decorate your home with figurative art and hang paintings of people that you don't even know, even naked ones, and everything will still be fine. Because of the corona, everything has changed. And um, so I was supposed to be giving this gallery talk down at the Art Loft Sainsville in front of my love Athena Triptych, which made its beautiful debut just a few weeks ago. Um, and I was gonna be talking all about the Goddess Project in front of that painting. Um, of course, everything has changed. So now I will be telling you about the Goddess Project from the beauty and comfort of my own home and studio, and you can watch it from the comfort of your own home. The Goddess Project is kind of a, my transition from Chicks with Balls, where I take a look at the legends and characters um, from mythology of all religions and view them through a feminist contemporary lens. My painting behind me, Arachne, Predator and Prey, is one of the paintings from the Goddess Project. The Arachne story in Greek mythology is that Arachne was a highly skilled craftsperson and tapestry weaver in ancient Greece. She was so good, she boasted of her skill, and um, word got back to the gods. And Athena, obviously, thought that who was Athena is the goddess of arts and crafts, among other things, uh, felt very threatened by her, and Arachne actually felt so confident in her skills that she challenged Athena to, this is one of my little favorite things, a tapestry weaving competition, if only all things were settled so, so nicely. Um, so this tapestry weaving competition, Athena rose to the challenge and Athena made a predictably beautiful tapestry showing the glory of the gods. These were all figurative tapestries. She throw, showed the glory of the gods on Mount Olympus, you know, looking all beautiful and her togas and everything like that. Arachne, however, did a painting or a tapestry that had a message of social injustice because it showed how basically the gods messed with the lives of the mortals down here on earth, which is exactly what they did. I mean, there's all of Greek mythology and much of other religions mythology, you know, is the gods messing with the lives of the mortals. Um, Arachne's tapestry was far more beautiful and truthful and, you know, everything about it was just very masterly. Athena got super duper jealous and in a violent fit of rage, she tore up and destroyed Arachne's, Arachne's um, tapestry. Arachne, fearing that she would be next, went, ran away and tried to hang herself. Athena found her, she's a goddess, took her down from the rope and said with what I imagine to be great false fanfare, told her that, oh, no, 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 you are such a superior tapestry weaver, you should hang on a rope forever and weave forever. And basically what she did she, at that point is she turned Arachne into a spider. What I've shown here in my painting is Arachne at the point, I returned her humanity to her and I've shown her at the point where the enchantment is starting to take place, where she's sprouting the multiple arms. She's still doing the weaving and everything, but I've returned her humanity to her for this painting. I've also wrapped her in the silken threads that um, spiders wrap their prey in. So Arachne is, at this, in this painting, both predator and prey. So let's continue the walking tour showing the different pieces of figurative art that essentially fill my home. I don't think I have anything else but. Here's a little Max Ginsburg that I love. This wall right here is something that I like to call a wall full of small. I have a beautiful little piece by Karen Offit here and a bunch of my own life drawings and life painting studies, one by Carol Arnold that I got at the Portrait Society in their six by nine auction. And then let me turn your attention over to this little wall right here where I have a painting, three-part painting of my cameraman, 
Mark, my son, when he was way younger. And then right below it is the best man, Paul Donnelly, who I know is watching right now. There's your painting. Hopefully you will get a kick out of it. Paul, actually his wife, Leah, posed for chicks with balls too. Not that Paul posed for chicks with balls. It was just Leah that posed. So now I'd like to draw your attention on my little docent tour of my mythology collection. Um, this is a painting of my friend Emily who wanted to pose for the Chicks with Balls project. And it was right at the point where I was kind of con converting to the uh, goddess project. So I said, hey, let me think of a goddess for you. Emily has the awesome distinction of being a phenomenal patron of the arts. She is a fixture at every Northeast Ohio gallery reception. Every time I go to a, um, an art show, I see her there and she has probably two other art shows that same night on her dance card. The fact that all these art shows are getting canceled right now because of the corona really, really stinks and I can't wait to just get back to normal where I can see her again at all these, at all these art venues. Emily is awesome also because she is simply a patron of the arts and she is not an artist herself. One of the things when you go to these gallery openings 95% of the people are, are actually artists themselves. So it's really awesome to meet somebody who is pure patron, pure appreciator of all things light and, and artistic. Um, so I thought Emily needed, I thought she should be a muse actually. And I started researching the muses, the Greek muses. And uh, one of the things I discovered, there were nine muses and there's all kinds of muses for things like for um, remembering things. There's a muse for astronomy. There are three muses for singing, like for hymns and ballads and like different kinds of singing. There is no muse for the visual arts. So I made Emily the 10th muse, the one who sees as the muse for the visual arts. And I gave her a mandorla of paintbrushes, which is only befitting a muse of the visual arts. This painting has a little bit of a reference to my muse, or one of my main inspirate, ins, inspirers, um, John Singer Sargent. He did a portrait of Isabella Stewart Gardner, which is in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I took the pose from that and did the, the mandorla and made Emily the 10th muse. So let's keep on going through the docent tour. Figurative art here, figurative art there. And we will go on, keep on going. And right now I'm walking by the two other paintings in the Arachne triptych. The, the three of them together look gorgeous together. And the only time they've been together was at the Joby Gallery last year, right about this time as part of the Figural Diptychs show, which was curated by um, the Bennetts from the uh, Bennett Collection and the Bennett Prize. And they look, they look stunning together. And I'm really hoping that there will be a restaurant or someplace that, you know, like a Mediterranean restaurant that might want an Arachne painting, like a mythological painting like that. And they have a really long wall that they can put it all up on. So it's always my hope. All right, let's round the bend a little bit. We're gonna come over here. This little wall right here is my Winged Victory wall. It is um, also from my mythology collection. In the Louvre, there is a sculpture, an ancient, uh, ancient Greek sculpture called Winged Victory. And much like many of the Winged Victory, or much like many iconic sculptures of female ideals of beauty, Winged Victory does not have a head and she does not have any arms. She's got these gorgeous wings. She's got this beautifully, you know, carved marble drape, drapery all over her, but she doesn't have a head, she doesn't have arms. So I kinda, I, uh, what I wanted to do for my Winged Victory paintings, I gave her a head and arms and a lot of soul. I used my older model who, I, I love painting her. I've probably painted her like a hundred times. She has these beautiful 
sinewy flesh and it every bit of the flesh is like a portrait um, which is why I like painting people with as much skin as possible uh, because for me the portrait does not stop at the neck it goes all the way down one of the things I loved about her she's got this soulful soulful face right here and I always love love painting that um, the winged victory aspect of it I gave her antique rug beaters to hold because I saw these antique rug beaters as symbolizing a dichotomy of things. Um, first of all, they are instruments of violence because you use them to beat rugs, to beat the dirt out of the rugs. So they are instruments of violence. But they also have this delicacy where they look like wings. They look like insect wings or butterfly wings or fly wings or something like that. And I saw her beautiful, experienced, sinewy body as one that has gone through all kinds of stuff. Um, and she took charge of these. She held them with you know, forcefulness and everything, like where she may have been beaten, but she's not beaten, essentially. And I had her pose in all different, all different ways holding them all different angles, and um, I just love the look of that. It's not a specific goddess, but it is based on antiquity and Greek. I'm not sure if the, uh, if the original winged victory was supposed to represent a particular god or goddess, but these are my winged victory paintings. And now we come to my Venus corner. So here in my Venus corner, I have my little Venus de Milo, who is another goddess from antiquity, who also doesn't have any arms. She does have a head though, and it's a very beautiful one, which I'm very happy about. And she actually will be the uh, inspiration for a future painting that right now is on my on deck circle, but it's not quite yet on my easel. Um, and spoiler alert, I give her back her arms and she will be armed and dangerous. But she will not have a gun because I believe in sensible gun laws. Um, anyway, so my Venus corner. Basically, when I started thinking about the whole Venus concept, the first thing that ran through my head was that song that um, the by the Shocking Blues. And it's the goddess on the mountaintop uh, oh shoot, now, now I gotta sing it. <laughs> I, was try, I was trying to say it and not be embarrassing. The goddess on the mountain top, burning like a silver flame, <laughs> the summit of beauty and love, and Venus was her name. Do, 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 do. She's got it. Yeah, baby, she's got it. Anyway, so it keeps on going on. I will stop with the singing because my camera man is going to shut the camera off if I keep on going. But um, anyway, so I started thinking about that. The Shocking Blue background is a reference to the Shocking Blues, who were the ones that, that, sang that, that sang that song. The other thing that I wanted to do with it was show an African-American woman as Venus for many reasons. Historically, Venus has been depicted as a fleshy, pale, languishing woman on a couch, you know, waiting there just for you, you know, all sort of lazy and sexuality and stuff like that and fertility. Um, and she's also been an icon and an ideal of beauty. I feel like there are many different ways that we can show ideals of beauty besides the, you know, 25 year old voluptuous girl. There's African American beautiful women and older beautiful women. Um, I also did a little more research on Venus herself as the as the um, the goddess that she was or is um, and found out that Venus was not only fertility and sexuality and stuff I found out that Venus was also a bringer of peace and her bringing peace and her message of, of kindness and peace tempered the warlike testosterone bravura of, um, of the god Mars, who is the god, the god of war. And so she, it brought balance to the universe where you've got the war and the peace sort of tussling against each other. 
So she brings good things to the world. One of the things that I also remember from mythology is that a lot of times when people bring good things to the world, they are punished for it. So I saw Venus as perhaps maybe more of a Prometheus character. Prometheus is, in case you don't remember your mythology, he is the one who brought fire down, he's a god who brought fire from Mount Olympus down to the mortals on Earth. Um, previously, the, the mortals on Earth didn't have fire. They, occasionally they would get fire when Zeus decided to send a lightning bolt and light up a tree and then, whoa, they've got this miracle of fire. They didn't know where it came from. It goes away, it doesn't go away. It's just pure magic. Prometheus brought them fire that they could use for cooking and you know heating their homes and stuff like that. Um, this, of course, angered the gods up in Mount Olympus. Zeus was so angry, he decided to take poor Prometheus and uh, strap him to a mountaintop, a, the cliffside, where every single day the vultures would come and eat his liver. And because he was a god, the... Uh, the liver grew back every day and the vultures came back the next day and had another meal. So it kind of sucks to be a deity in those uh, circumstances. But this is a painting right here by Rubens that's in the Metropolitan, which like the Zanesville Museum of Art is also closed right now. Um, but it really has stuck with me. So the Prometheus character is basically punished for doing, for doing good. I saw the interpretation of the Prometheus character as also um, uh, an African-American woman. Historically and traditionally, African-American women have brought all kinds of wonderful things to the world. Peace, love, strength, joy, all kinds of good things. They have, by force, choice, or necessity, cared for children, cared for their own children, cared for the children of others, nursed their own children, nursed the children of others, cared for the elderly, their own elderly, the elderly of others. Um, they've been inspiring as artists, musicians, authors, and um, entertainers and athletes. They have taken on major leadership roles where they're, um, you know, Fighting for, fighting for civil rights, for human rights, whether they're standing up or sitting down for civil rights, they've done amazing, amazing things. And um, I feel like through, throughout history, they have also been abused, used, derided, and you know, vilified for doing all these good things as sort of punishment, and yet still, they bring good, they do good in the world. So I thought that an African-American woman as the symbol of this Prometheus Venus concept really uh, needed, to be, needed to be painted. It was a painting I felt needed to be painted. Um, and here she is bringing her fire to the world. Now, one of the things you might notice, or maybe you, not, you might not notice, but I will point it out to you, is that the world she's looking down upon is to the Western eye or to our standard globes, um, it's upside down. So we've got Africa at the top. And my question is, why is that considered upside down? The whole universe is just a bunch of balls floating around. Where, who says what's up and what's down? It could all be sideways, it could be anyway. So there's, no, there's nothing that says that the United States and Russia and Europe are all the, the things that are on the top and that Africa and South America and um, Australia are the things at the bottom. There's nothing that says that, but the map makers were European, just like the, the writers of history were European and history is written and maps are made by you know, the people that are, that are in power. So I flipped the, flipped the world for her and Africa is on top here. Um, my other Venus, another interpretation of Venus, I used my older model. I should go this way. Right here. Okay. I used my older model again, and because I, I love painting her. And basically, this is a Venus who has given so much to the world, given her fertility, her youth, her prime, her everything. And she's been 
very much used, used and maybe used up by the world. Um, but she's still gorgeous and she's still giving more and more to the world. I also made her uh, braids kind of a little bit fallopian up there. And for both my Venuses, I put the planet Venus behind their head as their halo because I thought it would be a really good, powerful, impactful thing. So, moving along from Venus, I'm now going to take you into the studio. <laughs> and show you Medusa. But don't be scared. This is one that you're allowed to look at and you won't turn to stone. So, here's my two Medusa paintings. I will tell you a little bit about the Medusa story now, which you may already know. You probably know Medusa's the one with the snakes for hairs, for hair, and if you look at her, you turn to stone. So that pretty much everybody knows that. The, the story in Greek mythology um, is that Perseus, who is a young demigod, you know, very, whatever, handsome prince, handsome prince charming kind of guy, was for reasons way too complicated to tell here, had to go and kill Medusa, cut off her head and bring back the head to the king that wanted him to do it. So what he did, in fact, Athena helped him with this because Athena gave him her mirrored shield so that he could use the mirrored shield, look at Medusa behind his back, kind of like, you know, in the rearview mirror, and then kill her with his sword behind his back. Um, so in the story, that's what he does. He gets the head, he comes back to the king, everything's wonderful, it's, you know, all good fun mythology. One of the things though, the story behind the story, the apocryphal story of Medusa, is that Medusa actually started her life as a young, beautiful woman. And she had the supreme misfortune of being raped by the god Poseidon. He's the one with the trident and he's the water god, the, you know, the, the god of the seas. Um, she, he was raped by the god, she was raped by the god Poseidon in uh, Athena's sacred temple, goddess Athena, the, Athena's sacred temple. So, and it's a classic story of victim, of rape victim blaming and shaming because Athena, instead of being angry at Poseidon for being the rapist, she is angry at Medusa for desecrating her temple. So, she gets angry and what does she do? She turns the lovely young Medusa into a snake-headed Gorgon who whose look turns men to stone so that no man will ever look at her again. She's basically cursed for her beauty and her misfortune. Um, so that is classic rape victim blaming. And for my Medusa paintings, I have returned her humanity as well, returned her beauty. And one of the things I've done is I've mixed a little Christian and contemporary iconography into it and given her a um, hashtag stigmata here on her hand, basically to acknowledge that she is part of the Me Too movement. And the painting is called hashtag Me Dusa Two. The two of them together are, are a diptych. So, if you remember the first story that I told, which was the Athena story, and then this one right here, right now. Athena, I'm sorry, the first one is the Arachne story, and this one is the Medusa story. In both these, Athena, the goddess Athena, figures large as the evil one. She's the, she's the bad guy, bad woman. Um, I think that, in and of itself, is a not yet another myth that needs to be busted, because it's, it's symbolic of the queen bee syndrome, which is where a woman at the top can stand no others. That theme, like she won't let other women, she won't help other women, she has to smite them. And Athena did exactly that when she smited, you know, Arachne for weaving a superior tapestry or Medusa for being raped in the wrong place. Um, the queen bee syndrome basically keeps groups of wise women from the from 
ruling together because when groups of wise women get together and work things out, much good can be done. Things can be solved in peaceful ways. But with the queen bee syndrome that Athena is, you know, is wreaking, wreaking vengeance on everybody, she should be mentoring, she should be nurturing, she should be helping young women to come up and be her peers, to be her mentees, to be you know, working with her. And that's the kind of thing that I think we as a society now should also be working on. I do see a lot of uh, rays of hope on that because um, I do see things a lot of times, you know, in, in the political arenas where women are working together so that there are more than just one woman at the top. There's many women and that's, you know, that's a very positive thing. That concept is what I work on with the um, My Love Athena triptych, which is the one that's locked up right now in Zanesville and nobody can see it um, because all the museums are closed. But it's right now at the Zanesville Museum of Art. I'm sorry, it's at the Zanesville Art Loft in a, in a satellite exhibition to the Zanesville Museum of Art. Um, but I will do a little bit of a tableau vivant, which if you don't know what that is, don't feel bad because I had to Google it myself. That's where you reenact an epic painting. So what I'm going to show you is this is this is the Love Athena triptych. What I did with the Love Athena triptych is, okay, I recast myself as in the role of Athena, but this is a good Athena who takes care of her sisters, who cares for other women and protects them. So I put on this helmet. I got a big old Athena shield. I made the reflective shield by using my characteristic garden gazing ball that I've used for all my other chicks with balls paintings. Um, and I reflected my studio in it. And then, instead of wielding vengeance, I wield a paintbrush on my sisters. I also, in the painting, I'm wearing my beautiful necklace here which is designed by Kim Mati Jewelry. She's an awesome person and she also posed for Chicks with Balls. Her painting is part of the collection. Um, this necklace honors a mysterious woman named Betty whose whole life is on this charm bracelet and Kim Mati made it into a, uh, a necklace for me because I have my own charm bracelet. So, so basically, um, I, you, I, for my Love Athena triptych, I gathered several of the women who had posed, there probably eight, there's eight of us in the, in the whole triptych, women who had posed previously for chicks, many of whom who had gone through some major changes over the past five or six years since they first posed, many have gone through hell and back, and we're all holding shields of our own because we're all protecting our own people, and we're also standing in solidarity and protecting each other which is really what Chips with Balls and The Goddess Project is all about. Um, I would also like to, if you, if you are interested in Chips with Balls, I want to let you know that there's two Chips with Balls books now, both of which are available at the museum shop at Zanesville Museum of Art, which is locked up right now. But they're also available on my website. And if you order a book, I will send you a sticker or two or five, however many chips with balls you might know that you might want to give the car sticker to. And I also want to send out some major, major thank yous. I want to say thank you to my family, first of all. My son Mark is taping this whole thing right now. It's not even called taping. I don't know what it's called, making a film of it, of the whole thing right now. My son Eric is on tech support. Um, he's, <laughs> he's downstairs doing tech support. Um, all three of them, David, Eric, and Mark, came down to the Art Loft Zanesville for the opening of the Love Athena triptych a couple weeks ago. I want to thank my husband who helped move my show all the way down to Zanesville, helped you know, get it all moved into the museum, and in a couple weeks he's gonna go back down there and pick it up with me. Um, you know, huge thank you to them. I want to thank the ladies of the Art Loft Zanesville, who hosted the beautiful opening 
um, for the Love Athena triptych. That's Sandy Booth, Susan Stubbins, Susan Nash, and Linda Graham. And then I also want to send out a huge thank you to all the people who came to the Chips with Balls show and all the people who sent their words of support. It means so, so much to me that you guys have all been, you know, so behind me on that. I really, really, really appreciate it. Every single woman who posed for Chips with Balls, I want to send a huge thank you. I do not have your names memorized, but I have them totally committed to my, to my head. And last but not least, certainly last but not least, um, a huge thank you to the Zanesville Museum of Art for having the balls to show the Chips with Balls show. It was, the whole experience was pure pleasure, corona or no corona. Um, the opening was awesome. Everything about it was wonderful. I want to thank the staff, Catherine Applegate, Kristen Smart, Misty Johnson, Dan Pitcock, and most of all, Lane Snyder for having faith in me and showing this show. It was all a wonderful, wonderful experience. And to finish it off, one more little message. Here's, okay, everybody, wash your hands, all that stuff, you know, do all the good stuff. Here's hoping that <laughs> this beer is about six years old. I hope it is not gonna shake up all over the place. Here's hoping that staying apart will someday bring us all back together.